Now we commence our service this morning by singing to God's praise from Psalm number 42. Psalm number 42 we read and sing in English. And uh, this morning the two first Psalms will uh, be in English and the final Psalm in Gaelic. Psalm number 42 and from the beginning uh, a Psalm that is entitled to the chief musician Maskell for the sons of Korah. Psalm 42 at the beginning, like as the heart for water brooks, in thirst that pant and bray, so pants my longing soul, O God, that come to thee I may. My soul for God, the living God doth thirst, when shall I near unto thy countenance approach, and in God's sight appear and so on to the end of the verse mark 5 psalm number 42 verses 1 to 5 like as the heart for water brooks in thirst the pant and bray eternal and ever gracious God we draw now nigh into thy thrice holy presence into the presence of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost 
And as we draw into thy thrice holy presence, O God, this morning we do so, confessing that thou art indeed one God in three persons. And we praise thee, O Lord, that uh, we can indeed come before thee. And uh, we do so with uh, boldness and yet with godly fear. For that is how thou would have us come. Uh, we are to come, O Lord, with that reverence. Not being afraid, but a reverential worship of thyself. And uh, we uh, bemoan and uh, are cast down when there is a casualness about coming into thy presence. For thou art indeed the one true God who has made heaven and earth. Thou art the one who upholds all things by a word of thy power. Thou art the one who is indeed uh, the great God of eternity. The one who said, I am that I am. Uh, the one who is self-existent and the one who is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. The one in whom is light and no darkness is found at all. So gracious Lord, as we come before thee, before the one who does search our hearts and knows us, the one who enters into the very thoughts of our minds and sees what those uh, thoughts are, the one who knows the imaginations of our hearts and the schemings of our hearts. O oh Lord, we come and we lay ourselves bare before thee. And how must we not come with reverence? And how must we not come with heads that are bowed before thy majesty and before thine eternal glory? And gracious Lord, that uh, as we have thoughts of thy majesty, and thoughts of thy glory even before we enter into thy holy presence this morning. We pray that we might nevertheless come with boldness. Uh, we can come with such because we have access into thy presence. We have uh, that way that is opened up for us. That new and that living way. Uh, because we can come in and through the rent veil of his own flesh. And we praise thee, O Lord, that uh, there is indeed the blood of sprinkling that is sprinkled upon the mercy seat. Oh, not the blood of those animals of old that were pale types and poor shadows of that eternal sprinkling uh, that would be. Uh, but we praise thee that it is now the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, that it is his blood that is sprinkled upon the mercy seat of atonement. And uh, gracious Lord, as we draw now, and uh, we approach unto thee, we approach uh, only because of that shedding of his blood. Uh, we come uh, before thee and uh, into thy presence with a renewed fellowship because uh, of uh, that uh, life uh, that was given, because of that blood that was shed that which was typified and brought before us, uh, even in those skins that were provided for the covering of our first parents. And, O oh Lord, this morning as we come, uh, we look unto that righteousness of Christ, uh, that righteousness that he has given unto his own, a perfect righteousness, an imputed righteousness, a righteousness, O oh Lord, that when we look and peer into the depths of our own hearts, and see our sin, that we can say with the apostle as every Christian must be led to say, that I am the chief of sinners. And nevertheless, before the tribunal of a holy God, and thy people are seen and viewed as righteous, because they are viewed in that righteousness of Christ, uh, the one who, as he went through this world, lived that perfect life and made himself obedient under the law, so that we might have his righteousness laid to our account. And gracious and eternal Lord, this morning as we come before thee, we remember our congregation and uh, we pray for it. Uh, we pray that in these times when uh, we have not that fellowship in the courts of thy presence, uh, that thou would be the one uh, who would draw us ever closer unto thyself and to one another. We pray that uh, we might indeed over these days of confinement be praying all the more for each other. 
that over these days of confinement we might be studying the things of thyself all the more, that over these days when we are laid aside and uh, have less of the cares and the concerns of this world, oh, that we might be taken up in prayer and in supplication. We pray, Lord, that uh, thou would indeed be pleased to bless us. We remember any who are laid aside at this time with illness, and uh, we pray that thou would draw close to them. We thank thee for the health and the strength that thou hast given to others. Uh, we thank thee, O Lord, for uh, the uh, the apparent uh, uh, easing of the situation of the Prime Minister of our country. We pray that uh, thou would continue to bless doctors and nurses. And we pray especially that thou would be pleased to bless this visitation unto him, even unto his soul, uh, that in seeing the hand of thyself, as thou hast laid it against this nation, seeing the hand of thyself as thou hast laid it against him, and indeed many uh, of our fellow citizens, uh, we pray that uh, he might see also the hand that has given him a measure of restoration, and that in seeing that hand, he might indeed kiss that hand, uh, even the hand of his maker. And gracious Lord, as uh, we come before thee now again, we pray that thou would be with our nation. We pray that there might indeed be a lifting up uh, collectively of the eyes of men and women and young people especially uh, onto uh, the hills from whence that come our aid. We pray, gracious Lord, that now thou would go before us, that thou would accept of us, and all we ask is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now we turn in the scriptures to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms in chapter 61, Psalm 61, and uh, we read this short psalm from the beginning, Psalm 61 and uh, from the beginning, to the chief musician upon Niganah, a psalm of David. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Selah. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Thou wilt prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Thus far we read in the word of God, and we pray that God will be pleased to bless this reading of his own holy an infallible word for his name's sake. Now we praise God in Psalm number 66. Psalm number 66. A psalm that is entitled to the chief musician, a song or psalm. Psalm number 66. And from the beginning of the psalm we read, O lands to God in joyful sounds, aloft your voices raise, sing forth the honour of his name, and glorious make his praise. Say unto God how terrible in, our, in all thy works art thou, through thy great power thy foes to thee shall be constrained to bow. All on the earth shall worship thee, they shall thy praise proclaim in songs, they shall sing cheerfully unto thy holy name. Come, 
and the works that God had wrought with admiration see in working to the sons of men most terrible is he psalm number 66 verses 3 to 5 say unto god how terrible in all thy works art thou Turn with me please to that portion of God's word that we read, uh, Psalm number 61, Psalm number 61, and we read again from the beginning of the psalm. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now David is speaking here as a believer, as one who had known and loved the Lord for many years. And he is now reaching old age. And this is a particular time in the point of David's life because this is the time when he has fled from his own son Absalom. And you will remember that there were two flights in David's life. The first time was when he was fleeing from Saul because Saul was prepared to take his life. And the second time is the time that we have here, we believe. It is the time that he has fled from Absalom, his own son. And you will remember that this was a particular grief. Of course it was. It was that he was fleeing uh, from his own flesh and blood. It was also a particular providence, a dark providence to him. Because now David was older, now he was more feeble, he was less able. It was uh, a time of great distress because it was a time when he was taken by surprise. And one of the unkindest things of all was, not only was he fleeing uh, from Ahithophel, his friend, but also from uh, Absalom his own son. And you will remember that that account uh, of David's feelings is, is brought before us in Second uh, Samuel chapter 17. You will remember he's on the rooftop and he, his eyes are, are cast down uh, onto the ground itself. So it was a time 
of a great uh, turmoil and difficulty in the life of David. And there might be many of us, and we're going through those uh, times even in our own experience, not maybe uh, the account that we have brought before us here. We would hope that certainly that would not be so. But nevertheless, we are cast down. Maybe we're cast down spiritually. Maybe we're cast down by a load of cares. Maybe we are even cast down by all that is going on in society today with the spread of disease and the spread of pestilence. Well, friends, I want us to consider uh, this uh, portion of God's word with you, uh, looking on to that rock that is higher than I. And the first thing I want us to consider is this. What is the rock which David imagined? What is that rock which David imagined? Now, in a very practical sense, uh, there might have been a, a, a rock that David had in his childhood, gone time and time again to a, a place of security that he had gone uh, to when he was in trouble. And that was what was coming before his mind. And it's often the case, isn't it? That we, we transfix our minds upon certain things. And, and then that leads us to think about uh, the Lord. Well, John Calvin, uh, commenting on this, uh, this um, psalm here before us, speaks about the need to uh, divest the psalm of its figure and of its type. Uh, he would suggest that that is indeed in order to take our minds more of the uh, the physical thing that David might be looking onto, um, more onto the spiritual representation itself. You see, this rock that was uh, higher than David was a, a rock that means a, a citadel, a place of security. And friends, that place of security is brought before us so very often in Scripture itself. That place of security in Scripture, that rock in Scripture, is indeed, we believe, of reference to none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now you say this morning, where do we get that from? Well, friends, let us look at some of the places in the Scriptures where the rock is referred to. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16 and verse 18. Uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ is there with Peter and uh, they are discussing about uh, who uh, the men are saying that Christ is. And Christ says to Peter, oh, who do you say that I am? And he, he says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord Jesus Christ says upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That is the rock upon which the church is built. And we also see this uh, coming out before us in uh, Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, that he that believeth shall not make haste. And again, those words are brought to us in Romans 9 and verse 33. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion, a stumbling block and rock of offence, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Who is that? It is the one who is the rock of offence. Christ will be the rock of salvation to some, but he will be the rock of destruction unto others. And then we we uh, see that in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10 and verse 4, that Christ is that rock. That rock was Christ. It's given again in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Christ himself, the chief corner 
stone. So there is that citadel, that city, that stronghold, that place of security, and it is a rock, and that rock is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, though this world be uh, the king around us, though it be falling apart around us, if we are on that rock, which is Christ, we have a solid foundation. Though the world be consumed, if we are on Christ, there is that security that the world itself does not have. And in a spiritual sense, men must indeed be on that rock. Friends, we are not interested in filling churches for the sake of filling churches. We are not in uh, the business of building congregational or denominational party structures. Some might be, we're not interested in that. What we are interested in today, friends, is to get men and women and young people to be resting upon that place of security for their soul, for time, but more importantly, for eternity. That we would have the spirit of Andrew himself. He first founded his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Ah, friends, that is surely the, uh, the nature of our calling today. It is uh, that we would indeed point men and women to that rock that is higher than I. It's interesting that uh, the way the construction here and the original uh, from uh, Psalm uh, 61 and verse 2. David says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now, there is a sense, of course, in which that rock is superior. Uh, it is higher than us in, in a superiority. Um, that is, the Lord is uh, above us. The Lord is high. But it is that idea that the rock is higher than I. The rock is high up. I cannot attain it. Lead me onto that place because I cannot attain it. I cannot climb that high. And friends, neither can you. And neither can I today climb that high. We need that help and that leading from the Lord himself. So that rock is uh, a rock in a spiritual sense. It is Christ himself. And the mind, your mind and my mind today, uh, whatever uh, sense of abeyance it has gone into over these uh, past times, it must be fixed upon eternity. And it must be fixed upon that rock. You see, David must think, no matter here, he might be pursued by his friend. He might be even more so pursued by his own son, Absalom. Nevertheless, he must not be concerned about those things. He must be concerned about safety and security. And we are not to be concerned about trivialities. There are many things uh, today that... Uh, might indeed engage our mind. And um, those things are not always wholesome. Those things might be right and proper in their uh, correct perspective. Uh, we might indeed have that, that desire to, to pursue a career. Now, there's nothing wrong in that. Indeed, everything is right in that. But if that pursuit uh, overtakes our, our spiritual uh, desire to have our souls right with God and uh, encouraged with the Lord and feeding day by day upon Christ, then it is a wrong pursuit. If that pursuit is, is to find a partner in life, uh, if we, we begin to change our ways and uh, we begin to change our, uh, our closeness in our relationship to the Lord, you know, you can often tell a person whose relationship with the Lord is beginning to loosen. Beginning to loosen. Uh, they, they begin to go different places. They begin to change their views, especially in the, in the religious realm. Maybe it is that they, they, they want a partner in life and they think that if they stay in a particular place, they won't get that partner in life. If they adhere to certain views and practice certain forms of worship, they won't get that partner in life. 
Well, friends, the Lord has a way of, of raising up those uh, that he has chosen for us from eternity, a partner in life. And uh, if we begin to plough our own fodder, if we begin to go down a road that is unwholesome and is uh, compromising and disobeying to himself, then he can bring great sorrow into our lives. And who do we have to blame? Do we blame the Lord? No, friends, we have to blame ourselves. Well, David here was looking to that rock that was higher than him, and his mind was only concentrated on the place of safety. You remember there in uh, Joshua chapter 20, we have brought before us the cities of refuge. And you will remember the account we have preached on it before about the, the manslayer. And uh, if he accidentally uh, killed his friend, uh, he could uh, flee to one of these cities of refuge because the avenger of blood, the, the next of kin of the dead man, would pursue uh, that manslayer. And uh, the manslayer wasn't, uh, could not afford to be concerned about uh, how quickly he would um, get there or how slowly he would get there. He had to concentrate upon getting there as quickly as possible. He couldn't be concerned about the scenery or about the various things around about him. He had to pursue. And friends, that is what we need to do. We need to be the one uh, who will indeed uh, go to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he alone is the rock. And outside of that rock, we perish. We perish. We perish if we're not resting and trusting upon the rock. We flounder and we expose ourselves to danger if we are the Lord's people and we're trying to move off the rock. Uh, so David could come here and he says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now the translators of the authorised version most assuredly had uh, in mind that this rock was Christ. You'll notice there it is in capital letters, a capital uh, commencing letter. It is there a reference to Christ himself. So the rock which David imagined, yes it may have been something in his own mind, a place of security, a place of safety, but it led David ultimately to think unto the Lord and to the Christ of God. In the second place, we notice that what the rock provided, David himself could not provide. And that is so with you and with me as well, friends. Those who fail to make it to the rock are lost. That place of security that David was going to seclude himself in, away from Ahithophel and away from uh, Absalom, uh, that place that was going to shelter him from their attacks and from their sword, he himself admitted he could not provide. And friends, in a spiritual way, that is so with us. Christ is the one who is our security, the one who is our shelter. And if it is a case today that... Uh, some of you are still outside of uh, that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the situation. You know the situation of the human soul. You know that the soul by nature is under sin. That it has that fallen nature. It is indeed enslaved to sin. And you know that before God that there is a guilt. It is one thing to know that there is uh, sin in the soul. That's a, in many senses, that's an academic uh, question with an academic answer. But to really appreciate that there is sin in the soul then brings us to that second recognition, which is the one that is all important. And that is that if there is sin in the soul, then we are guilty before a holy God. And if we are guilty before a holy God, friends, that brings us in to the judgment of eternity. Eternity. 
where we will spend our soul. It's time's duration in the countless ages thereof. There was once an account of the Reverend Malcolm Gillis, who was Free Presbyterian minister in Stornoway. He died sometime in the 1940s. And one night as he was preaching in Stornoway, he mentioned that phrase that I have just mentioned, that we mention all the times ourselves, spending eternity. And he stopped in the pulpit and he paused in the sermon and he said, Ah, oh, he said, that is wrong. Because he said, eternity will never be spent. Eternity will never be spent. Friends, in 10,000 years in eternity will be as a moment just begun. And friends, therefore, it is vital that we know where our place of security is in. And we must come to that recognition that we cannot provide this for ourselves. David had fled from Absalom. David had this helplessness as regards himself. You see, if David could sort out the problem, why would he flee from Jerusalem? Why would he flee from Zion? Why would he flee from his palace and from the place of the temple? You see, he knew the truth. He knew that uh, this was an issue that could not be sorted out. And why is it that men and women today very often uh, fail to flee to Christ? It is because they themselves think that they can sort out their soul. And yet, friends, it is an impossibility. The rock that David sought was a rock that offered him much. It offered him protection from his foes, from Absalom uh, and indeed from the others. But friends, the rock that we are talking about, the rock of Christ, is uh, the one that provides us with that place of shelter from our great foe. And our great foe today is Satan himself. He is the one that keeps us in our sins. He is the one that has led us captive uh, in our sins. He is the one who would have us perish under the righteous wrath of a holy God. Now we see how vitally important it is that we go to that place of shelter, even Jesus Christ himself. Satan would also ensnare us not only in our sins that are past and in the sins that we, we do, but he would ensnare us in further sins with strong forged chains that would indeed not break. And that is why we need this fortress, this place of security, because this place of security offers us shade from the sun, from the sun of God's wrath, from those fearful righteous judgments of a holy God. And there is indeed spiritual application to each and every one of us here uh, this morning. There is that spiritual application uh, even to the children of God. You know it is not an easy thing uh, to be a Christian. It is not an easy thing uh, to plough a, a furrow that goes in the opposite direction. It is easy to compromise. Oh how easy it is to compromise with our worldly friends. How easy it is to compromise by, by those in the workplace and suffer peer pressure by those who would tell us uh, not to be thinking about the things of God, not to, to uh, have a belief in God. Or if we do believe in God, let us not take that step further and go into the house of God. Now, how easy it is to succumb to that. And that is what the devil does. That is how he influences us. That's how he keeps his following. But even as the Lord's people, how difficult it is. How difficult it is when we are in the workplace uh, to, to be uh, as the Lord would have us be. To be a person of our time. If we promise uh, our, our work uh, manager to be at a certain place at a certain time, are we there? 
Are we people of our word? Uh, are we those who enjoy the, the work that the Lord has given us in this life? Or is it a, a drudgery to us? Are we those who are constantly complaining? Oh, how unseemly and how unbecoming it is that so often when you speak even to Christians, it's always a complaint. Yes, friends, we, we have our concerns, we have our cares that might be great to us, but let us constantly and continually take them to the Lord. And uh, when I speak about complaints, I'm speaking about those who, who have a, a, a critical spirit. And we all have that at times. And how, how we need to guard against that. But you see here, uh, David was prepared to look to that rock that was higher than himself. That rock that would give him the security. He could have gone out and he could have complained and been critical of, of Absalom. He could have been doing that. And yet that would have given a cause of rejoicing uh, in, in the world to those who would say, Ah, well, you see, we can continue in our sins because there uh, is God's man and he's continuing in his sin as well. And when uh, the, uh, the sands might seem dry unto us when the desert might seem great before us we thank the lord that there are those times when we see the springs of water uh, ever coming uh, to us and that was indeed so with uh, moses of old in exodus chapter 17 he says behold i will stand before thee there upon the rock in horeb and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Friends, that rock that was struck was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a picture of him, the one who was struck by the sword of God. That water came out, and all with him it was blood, but nevertheless it was for cleansing. And it was for purity of his people. Uh, a waterless rock can only keep living for so long. John chapter 17, uh, John chapter 7 and verse 37. In that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Friends, if we are not drinking from that fresh springs of Christ, then we're drinking from the stagnant waters of this world. So we he see here the rock which David imagined. We see here that this rock could provide something that David could not provide for himself. And we see thirdly that uh, this uh, rock is a rock that is there uh, when we need that rock. You notice there it says from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. When my heart is overwhelmed. It is friends when we are cast down. When we are so utterly at the end of ourselves then it is at that time we will look to Christ. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Looking onto that rock which is higher than ourselves. If we have a sense of our own security today, if we have a sense of our own strength and our own righteousness today, then we will continue to admire ourselves and we will continue to look to ourselves. And if there is anything that this coronavirus has, has taught us, surely it is this. Surely it is this. That you have no strength and I have no strength. Uh, a molecule of a virus that is so small that you would have to place 16 of them to even fit on the head of a pin. And yet one of those is enough to take us down. 
It is a reminder to us, surely, friends, that we have no strength. We have no security. We have nothing that we ourselves can pride ourselves in. And it's only that when the sinner is overwhelmed, will he or she earnestly seek the Lord with all their heart. And what is that overwhelming? Well, that overwhelming surely is when we have an overwhelming sense of our guilt. Of our guilt. And that is produced when we come and we see the law of God. Do we realise, do any of us really realise how righteous and how holy God himself is? You know, it is a condescension upon God's part to even allow sinful men such as we are to take his holy name upon our lips. Not in profanity, not in casualness, but in prayer. God is so holy that he uh, would indeed have to suspend his his uh, sovereignty and his, in, in his uh, and only in his mercy does he allow us to take upon uh, our lips in prayer his holy name. And friends, if we realize the holiness of God, then surely before that God, we must recognize something of our guilt. And it is only when we have that consciousness of our guilt will we see uh, the righteousness of God. It is indeed a case, is it not, uh, that we, so often as we did in the past, we ask, what did I do wrong? So-and-so is doing that. Uh, I'm not as bad as the person down the road. Well, friends, unless you are as righteous and as holy as God is, you are not going to enter into heaven, and neither am I. We do not have that in and of ourselves. We do not have it even as Christians. We only have it before the judgment seat of God when we stand professing the name of Christ and it is the righteousness of God that is covering us. It is the blood of Christ that is covering us. That is the righteousness that we need uh, to be found on that day standing in his presence. And we are overwhelmed when we have the, the urgency of the matter. Our friends, there is an urgency. You cannot uh, take a day for yourself and say, well, I'm going to someday uh, put my trust in the Lord. I'm going to someday attend the house of God. I'm going to someday go before the Kirk session and profess his name. I've got many years laid up for me. Now surely over these days, strong men are falling. Young women are falling. Death knows no generation. Death knows no social class. Death goes into the royal family as well as it comes to those who are living on the streets of our nation. Friends, take no thought. The Bible tells us, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And we are overwhelmed when we have this desire to be reconciled with God and Christ. That is the best overwhelming of all. When the Lord has been speaking to your soul. When there are barriers uh, that uh, begin to uh, remove themselves. Uh, when you see the, the righteousness of Christ and you see our own guilt before him and you, you're uh, casting your burdens upon him and then your faith takes over and you're totally resting upon the beloved and you're overwhelmed. Well, friends, when you're so overwhelmed, where else can you go? Uh, but onto that rock that is higher than you and that rock that is higher than me even Jesus Christ himself, for he is the one that has the words of eternal life. In the fourth place we see 
that uh, from where we may seek this rock, from where we may seek this rock, it is at the end of the earth shall I cry unto thee. At the end of the earth shall I cry unto thee. David was now removed from Jerusalem. He was now removed from Zion. That speaks about the church in Jerusalem, uh, the Lord's people in Jerusalem. He was away from the temple. He could no longer hear the sounds of the horns as they were blowing over the sacrifices. He was away from the royal city. He felt as if he was at the end of the earth. And that is where we must be in order to seek the Lord. It was Rabbi Duncan who, who said that the truth of Scripture uh, is indeed that, that great fact that we must seek him and lay hold upon Christ. And yet we cannot do so unless God draws us. We must go and we cannot do so unless God gives us the power. We must seek him and yet we cannot seek him unless he calls. And how is this great conundrum worked out? It is only worked out when we lay it all upon the feet of Jesus Christ. He is the one who works it out. For he is the one who gives us the power to come. And he is the one who draws us by his spirit. When we are at the ends of the earth. And in the gospel we may remember and that as sinners we are far off. Our sins separate us from God. Uh, Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you. That he will not hear. So we are at the ends of the earth. We are separated from God because of our sins. Uh, we are separated from God because we are alienated. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse uh, 18. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. In a state of nature, without Christ, friends, we cannot even choose the things of God. And yet, no matter how far off we might be, the word of God is nigh us. It is beside us. It is close to us. Romans chapter 10. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. You know, over these days we... Uh, have uh, been perplexed by the medium that we have uh, in speaking uh, to you and in our time of worship. But friends, in some way, this might indeed be the Lord's measure to reach those who will not come unto the house of God. And if it reaches them and it speaks to their heart, then God will draw them onto the house of God. Because this is it might be for their souls that this is God's last uh, opportunity to them uh, to come and to close with Christ as he is offered to them in the gospel. But why, fifthly and finally, why do we need to be led to this rock? David says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Well, first and foremost, it is because David does not trust himself to get to the rock. He does not trust himself to get to the rock. As we said earlier on, the, the rock of the citadel is high above him. And he believes he has no strength. He knows he has no strength. No, and so he requests that he be led of God to this place of arrival and to this place of security. In other words, He's looking on to the hand of the Lord to lift him up. And friends, that is how you are to come. And that is how I am to come. No matter what our situation might be in these days, we are to look 
uh, unto the arm of the Lord, the strong arm of the Lord, uh, to deliver us. And sinners need not only a redemption supplied, but they need a redemption applied. So it's not only a redemption supplied, but a redemption applied. You see, uh, we have to come and acknowledge in a state of nature that we are lost. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why Christ came to save the lost. He didn't come to save the saved. He didn't come to save the righteous, for they are not looking on to him. They are trusting in themselves. Uh, we need to recognize that we are lost. That's who Christ came to. Uh, we need to recognize that we are helpless, that we are without strength, just as David was. We need to recognize uh, that we are blind. Romans chapter 2 and verse 19. And art confident that thou thyself art the guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. You see, friends, that is to be our confidence, that uh, Christ is our guide uh, to lead us because we are blind, a one who is going to be a light to show us uh, even through this dark world. David does not ask, he does not even ask to be enabled to come to the rock. Now we might find that strange. We would say, now wouldn't you think that David would pray to be enabled to come to the rock? No friends, he doesn't because praying even for faith is praying for a means. It would be like the man who was going to the city of refuge as we quoted earlier in Joshua chapter 20 sitting down by the roadside and praying that uh, the Lord might give him uh, legs that would run faster. No, what he was to do was he was to go. And that is what David comes. He doesn't ask that he would be enabled to go to the rock. Instead, he looks to the rock. He looks to Christ himself, the one who is the end. Not looking for a means to the end, but the end himself. And he asks to be brought so that he may be saved in his distress. Now friends, that applies to you today if you're outside of Jesus Christ. Uh, you are to come and you are to look onto that rock. You are to trust in Christ himself. But you might be here today and uh, you are one of the Lord's professing people. And there might be something that is shaking your faith. There might be something that is concerning your soul. There might be questions in your mind that are troubling you. You might be lacking assurance. Well, friends, it is the same procedure still. You're to look onto the rock that is higher than you. Yes, it is often difficult to get up uh, and reach up to that rock. But you're not even to ask for a means. You're to just continue to look in faith upon that rock, upon Christ himself. And he is the one who will lift us up and lead us onto himself. May the Lord bless these few thoughts to us this morning. Let us pray. Our gracious and eternal God, as we bow before thee, we thank thee for thy goodness for thy mercy to us. Though our situation be great and though there be many problems in this life, we are, O oh Lord, to continue to place our trust in thee and to be the one who will protect us from all of the foes and all of the enemies, even the last enemy, death itself. And gracious Lord, we pray that as we are looking on to that stronghold of thyself, uh, that our faith might be increased. Oh, we pray that we would be those who would grow in grace and in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. Gracious and eternal one, now we pray that thou would accept of us and all we ask is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now we close by singing to God's praise in Gaelic from Psalm number 61. Psalm number 61 and from the beginning of the psalm. A psalm that is entitled to the chief musician upon Niganoth 
A Psalm of David. Psalm 61 from the beginning. O God, give ear unto my cry. Unto my prayer attend. From the utmost corner of the land, my cry to thee I'll send. When time my heart is overwhelmed and in perplexity, do thou me lead unto the rock that higher is than I. And so on to the verse part 4. Psalm number 61 verses 1 to 4 in Gaelic to God's praise. Ji
Now the following are the uh, intimations uh, to uh, remind you, uh, God willing, uh, this evening uh, the service is broadcast at 6 p.m. and uh, we continue uh, our study in the book of Ruth. So we continue our studies in the book of Ruth this evening at 6 p.m. And the broadcast of the midweek meeting on Wednesday evening as usual at 7 p.m. And the services next Sabbath will go out at 12 noon and 6 p.m. And all these intimations are subject to the will of the Lord. Let us close with the Lord's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.